Welcome to the section on lipids and lipoproteins. We're just going to begin looking at lipid chemistry and what their roles are within the body. Back in the early 80s, people used to think that fats were something that was bad and something that would cause um, somebody to have high cholesterol. As time goes on, we're learning that um, the roles of lipids are becoming more and more important for many of our body functions. For example, it's a very rich source of energy and it's a very efficient way for the body to store calories. It's also a very integral part of cell membranes and plays a structural role within those cells. Not to mention, many of our hormones are made out of cholesterol as well. When we look at the different types of fats, there are different classifications. The first one being a fatty acid. Fatty acids are linear chains of carbon-hydrogen bonds terminating in a carboxyl group. The major constitu constituent of, um, there, it is the major constituent of phospholipids and triglycerides. We look at these fatty acids depending on how many carbon-carbon bonds there are. If it's saturated, there's no double bonds. Monosaturated means there's one double bond. And polyunsaturated means there's two or more double bonds. So you may have heard of those terms before. We look at a general um, lipoprotein structure, which we're going to get into in a minute. Um, you can see they're very complicated and have um, cholesterol integrated into its cell membrane. We've got apolipoproteins and a core, which consists of um, triacylglycerols and um, cholesterol esters as well. The next one is triglycerides. Triglycerides have three fatty acid molecules attached to one molecule of glycerol by ester bonds. The major constituent of, um, of a triglyceride is the fatty acids that we just talked about. Triglycerides with unsaturated fatty, acid, fatty acids tend to form oils at room temperature, and triglycerides with saturated fatty acids tend to be solid at room temperature. Things would be um, a saturated fatty acid, maybe like coconut oil, which is definitely hard at room temperature, and the other ones could be like vegetable oil. The next one is a phospholipid. The major constituent is a fatty acid. It's very similar to triglycerides, except for there's only two esterified fatty acids. This one is what we call amphipathic. It, um, it makes the phospholipid hydrophilic in nature, which means it's able to actually float through um, a liquid rather than floating to the top as most oils would. And they differ from a triglyceride in the fact that they have a phosphate group instead of a third fatty acid. The next lipid is cholesterol. This is an unsaturated steroid alcohol containing four rings and a single side chain tail. It's synthesized exclusively by animals in the liver. It's not ready, readily catabolized by most cells. It's not a source of fuel, and it, it doesn't act as an energy source like other lipids. But it is used for things like, um, like hormones. All right, getting back into that lipoprotein structure. A few slides ago, I had the picture of a lipoprotein. You saw that it had apolipoproteins. It had cholesterol inserted in the cell membrane. And it had a whole plethora of things on the inside of it as well. Um, they can be quite large. They're composed of lipids and proteins, which is where they get their name from. Their primary um, thing in life to do is to deliver fuel to our peripheral cells. It transports those lipids in the circulation because lipids are not water soluble. You know what happens when you pour oil into water? It floats to the top. We don't want that to happen inside our body. So they need to be transported by something like a lipoprotein. The first one we're going to look at is a chylomicron. It is huge but not very dense. It's up as big as 1,200 nanometers. It's produced by the intestine, and it helps carry um, lipids or triglyceride specifically from your intestines to your liver, um, where it can be turned into other types of um, lipoproteins, etc. The, the thing that we see most with chylomicrons is it's so light, it floats to the top of stored plasma and can um, form a creamy layer. It's a characteristic sign of chylomicrons. If somebody has very high triglycerides, you're going to see very high chylomicrons, and you may see serum that looks like this. It is very milky and creamy looking. Um, if it's hemolyzed, it actually looks like strawberry quick, that, that milk that you may have had as a kid. I think they still sell it, actually. The next one are very low-density lipoproteins, or VLDL. These are produced by the liver, 
and it carries the endogenous triglycerides, okay, the ones floating around your bloodstream. The um, endogenous means produced within the body, not the ones that are coming from your diet. Triglycerides and VLDL come from the liver. They transfer triglycerides from the liver to peripheral tissues, and um, they reflect light and account for turbidity as well, seen in a fasting hyperlipidemic plasma specimen. The next one is the low density lipoprotein. This one we refer to as the bad cholesterol. They're very low density, they carry a lot of cholesterol, and they form as a result of the lipolysis of LDL or the breakdown of LDL. It's readily taken up um, by the cells via an LDL receptor, but when there's too much present, it can cause atherosclerosis or the hardening of the arteries, which can cause problems. In order to calculate an LDL, we have to do a calculation. An LDL usually is not something that we do um, on the analyzer. We calculate it from other results. You are going to have to be responsible for knowing this calculation. I have it on the bottom here. It is LDL equals the cholesterol minus the HDL minus triglyceride divided by 5. Now, many of my students make the mistake of dividing the whole entire calculation by 5. Make sure only the triglyceride is divided by 5. We call this calculation the Friedewald calculation. Um, you cannot do this test if triglycerides are greater than 400. If the triglycerides are greater than 400, then we do something called beta quantification, which um, is a more specific way of them measuring the actual um, LDL and not doing the calculation. The next one is the good one. This is the good cholesterol high density lipoproteins. They're small and very dense. They're synthesized by the liver and intestine. What they do is they take the excess cholesterol from peripheral cells and bring it back to the liver so it can be repackaged and turned into something else. So this is something you want to have a high level of. The next one are apolipoproteins. These contribute to the structure of lipoproteins. You saw the lipoprotein about 10 slides ago and it had the apolipoproteins on the outside of it. It serves as a cell receptor and an activator or inhibitor of some enzymes. You need to know which ones are familiar for which. ApoA1 is a major protein on HDL. That is what you want to have a lot of. Okay? My, a lot of my students think A1, A1 steak sauce is very yummy, and HDL is very good, so they keep those together. The next one is ApoB. It's the major protein on LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. And these are things you don't want to have a very large abundance of. So ApoB, my students think bad. Major protein on LDL, VLDL, and those chylomicrons. But we do have two forms of ApoB. Uh, B100 is found on LDL and VLDL. And ApoB48 is found on chylomicrons. I think B48 sounds like a large um, airplane. I don't know. It's probably not the name of an airplane, but to me it sounds like it. And chylomicrons are large. So I always put those two together. You do need to be familiar with the reference ranges for these. Um, you will have to know them for a test. They're, they're ones that you memorize. Cholesterol should be less than 200. HDL needs to be um, greater than 40. LDL should be less than 130. And triglycerides should be less than 150. If any of these are out of range, if your HDL is too low, LDL is too high, triglyceride too high, cholesterol too high. It can be um, associated with heart disease. Usually we recommend a 12-hour fast. So let's look at what happens and how these lipids make it from your food into your body. First, there's lipid absorption. In digestion, the dietary lipids are converted to amphipathic lipids, which means we turn them into um, being hydrophilic or being able to float through your um, plasma freely without floating to the top, as most lipids would when you add them to water. They form micelles in the intestinal lumen, and when those muscles come into contact with microvillous membranes of intestinal mucosa cells, they're absorbed into the body. We usually eat, absorb, and transport about 60 to 130 grams of fat a day, and most of it is in the form of triglycerides. Triglycerides are highly affected by, affected by a recent meal. So if you go to Burger King and eat a, a big Whopper and fries, and then you come to get your blood drawn, it's going to be reflected um, on your triglycerides relatively quickly. Then we move on to the exogenous pathway. From here, the chylomicrons interact with proteoglycans on the surface of capillaries and various tissues in the circulation. 
Free fatty acids and glycerol form hydrolysis of triglycerides by lipoprotein lipase, and then they can be taken up for use by the cell. From there, VLDL loses core lipids, causing dissociation and transfer of apolipoproteins and phospholipids to other lipoprotein particles. And during this time, the VLDL is converted to VLDL remnants, which can be further transformed into LDL, which is that bad cholesterol I talked about. Only about half of the VLDL is converted to LDL, while the remainder is taken up as VLDL remnants in the, um, by the liver remnant receptors. After that, we've got HDL removing excess cholesterol from the cells. So those of you that like pictures, this is everything that I just talked about in a picture. Okay, So here's your dietary lipids down on the bottom. Okay, um, In your intestine, they are absorbed and carried by those big chylomicrons where they go to the liver. From the liver, VLDL is converted to LDL by lipoprotein lipase, where it's used by the cell, or it's carried back to the liver by HDL. Any excess lipids not being used are brought back to the intestine via bile. So this is a simple, kind of a simple um, depiction of all those things that I just mentioned. I'm not going to make you memorize or draw this out for me at any time, but I do expect you to know what the roles of each of these are. What role the liver plays, the chylomicrons, what they do, VLDL, LDL, and HDL. What their main role is along with their reference ranges. When we look at the lipid and lipoprotein population distributions, we see that women have a higher HDL cholesterol level, but lower total cholesterol and triglyceride than men. Although after menopause, we don't see a total difference. Total and LDL cholesterol and triglyceride levels all increase with age. So we have to work harder as we get older. I think everybody kind of kind of sees that as you get older, a lot of people exercise less um, and things like that. I think that plays a major role. Um, and plus your metabolism goes down from the less activity that you may have. Total and LDL cholesterol and triglycerides are much lower in young children than adults, I think as those little buggers are so active. At puberty, the boys' HDL cholesterol drops 20% to adult male levels. Lower rates of LDL cholesterol and heart disease are found in Asians as well. Atherosclerosis is the single leading cause of death and disability in the United States. Hypertension, elevated lipids, and chronic endothelial damage contribute to this. They say it's caused by lipids in the form of esterified cholesterol being deposited in artery walls. Fatty streaks develop into plaques that can block blood flow. But one thing I want you to really know about this is the main cause of atherosclerosis isn't from people just eating fat. It's from eating high levels of carbohydrates in the presence of toxic fats. If somebody is eating so many carbohydrates that they're unable to use fats for fuel, then those, um, those fats are going to build up because your body will always choose the carbohydrates first. So I think we've moved to a society of very high amounts of carbohydrates and, very, of, and especially not healthy carbohydrates. I'm talking about packaged um, processed foods. And when you're, you know, just supplying your body with those really fast forms of energy, these other forms of energy, such as fat, are going to um, wreak havoc in your body because you're not using them. Then we have hyperlipoproteinemia. These are diseases associated with elevated lipoprotein levels. This can include hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, and combined hyperlipidemia. When we see hypercholesterolemia, it's the lipid abnormality most closely linked to heart disease. We can see familial hypercholesterolemia, which is genetic, and we can have it where they're homozygotes, which is very rare. One in a million may have this, and we see heart attack in the teens. Then we have heterozygotes, which are mo more common, which you may not have problems, but it may show up. That's about 1 in 500. Hypertriglyceridemia, which is when they're very high, um, when they get that high greater than 500, um, it's usually to genetic or hormonal abnormalities. We can also have a combined hyperlipoproteinemia, which is high cholesterol and triglycerides. And um, we can have a lipoprotein A. Um, sometimes people have a um, very low level of apoprotein A, which can cause them to have um, an increased risk of coronary heart disease. 
Another one is called Tangier's disease or hypo-alpha lipoproteinemia. This is where there's a genetic decrease in HDL. The HDL concentrations can be as low as 1 to 2. This makes it very difficult for your body to bring the excess lipids back to your liver, so they end, to, they end up um, causing premature coronary heart disease. The major, major risk factors for coronary artery disease, number one, genetic predisposition. You can also um, be caused by elevated serum cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL, those types of things. Hypertension or high blood pressure, smoking cigarettes, and having a poor diet, especially one very high in processed carbohydrates. So how do we measure for these? Well, the lipids and lipoproteins are very important measures, so we do need to um, watch those. We have standardization decisions, cut points for coronary heart disease by the NCEP. What's nice about that is if you get your cholesterol tested in Green Bay, Wisconsin, if you get it done in Mankato, Minnesota, if you go to Denver, Colorado, there's going to be some comparison studies done where your cholesterol should not be different from place to place. That's where the NCEP comes into play. It's also um, done by hexane extraction after hydrolysis with an alcoholic KOH, followed by a reaction with Lieberman Bouchard colored reagent. You do not have to memorize that, but just know there is a special reaction that is done. We have um, the triglyceride measurement is useful in the detecting of metabolic disorders and cardiovascular risk. So we do um, test for those. With lipoprotein methods, if the doctor orders a very specific type of test, they can actually separate different lipoproteins based on density, size, and charge. We use special met methods such as ultracentrifugation, um, electrophoretic separation, chemical precipitation, chromatographic or immunochemical types of reactions. So they can do some pretty specific things with this. With the HDL methods, um, there's a, usually a two-step separation. Now we have a three-step process where ultracentrifugation removes VLDL, heparin manganese precipitation to remove LDL, and analysis of supernatant cholesterol by the Abel-Kendall assay. We also see compact analyzers. If you've ever had a health risk assessment um, done for your job, um, you may have seen this being used. Um, I know Rasmussen College comes in and does ours once a year, and this is the exact analyzer that they use. They do a finger stick, and it gives us a measurement of cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and glucose from a single finger stick. Like I said, there's analytic performance goals. These were established by the NCEP lab panels based on clinical needs. So for cholesterol, we need to make sure that there you, you are within a certain range. So if I have my cholesterol tested and it's 200 here, it better be close to 200 in Mankato and it better be close to 200 in Denver, Colorado. Okay, they try to keep the labs very close with this one. With quality control, again, there's external quality control material that is used. And specimen collection is usually through an ED, um, EDTA specimen or sometimes heparin um, is used as well. And um, we should be fasting, definitely fasting, 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 fasting. Once again, here's your ranges. You do have to memorize these. Cholesterol less than 200, HDL greater than 40, LDL less than 130, triglycerides less than 150. This completes our section on lipids.